Match Standing, the podcast where we review, relive, and rank the 100 greatest wrestling matches of all time. As always, I'm Spencer. I'm Bull McConnell's Hair Gel. And I'm having a really bad hair day. Fuck you, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck you. I knew it. I just knew you were going to go there. We are joining you from August 29th, 1994, from the United Center in Chicago, Illinois, SummerSlam 1994. There's actually two matches we could do from this card, there it is. <laughs> uh, but the one we're doing today is Ted DiBiase's Undertaker versus Paul Bearer's Undertaker, <laughs> one of the greatest wrestling matches of all time. But we're actually not doing the match itself. We're covering the action of the investigators. That's, that's who are right. Looking for Leslie the Undertaker. Nils- <laughs> it's like, what are you doing here? I'm on the case. No, no, no. I'm on the case. I'm on the case. No, Frank, we're both on the case. <laughs> <laughs> Spoiler alert. I'm ranking at number one. I'm just <laughs> letting you know. That's the new number one after this episode. Mm. Uh, but we are actually covering Alundra Blaze versus Bull Nakano for the WWF Women's Championship. Arguably the greatest feud in the WWF in 1994. Obviously, the only things that can touch it are Brett Owen and Sean Razor. But if you, I would throw it up there with, with those. I mean, it was just fun stuff that was going on. I'll say this right now. This match gets the... Best and loudest reaction from the crowd. Yep. It really the does. Main event, crickets. Yeah, I mean, this is also a card, you know, when you talk about those those rivalries that are so important, we have Brett Owen in the cage, right? So this is, you know, those two matches make make up for what otherwise is probably not a really good SummerSlam. Uh but it's not a bad summer. It's not a bad SummerSlam, right? And and I have a feeling I'll be forced to watch it at some point in my life, but from beginning to end. Uh, but on commentary, we have Vince and Jerry Lawler, uh, which if you've been listening to Last Mania Standing as a patron, you know how much I love that. Uh, and then oh, yeah. referee Tim White. Good old Tim White. Uh, Tim White. Uh, but yeah, Blaze, Nakano, this is the match that we wanted on the card uh, on our on our list for a really, really long time. And uh, man, I'm just so, so glad we're able to tackle it today. I am too. This this one, um, I, f- I feel like we've, all three of us at separate times have championed this match to be on there. And it's like, all right, sure, let's put it on a poll. And then it like, we always put it on a poll with like the other three matches that are better than it. Well, it's just, you know, people feel how they feel about polls. And a lot of times the feedback we get on our polls is that was really hard. Yeah. I'm just like, yeah, we'll try ranking it. Uh, Yeah. (laughs) Welcome welcome to the show, by the way. Welcome to the show. Uh, But yeah, but this last poll that we did uh, two weeks ago, if you're listening at this point, was it's so dead even. And there were four matches, and all four of them were, were pretty much even. And that was adding totals up between Patreon and Twitter votes. So, yeah, I, we decided let's do it. Let's do it right now because obviously there is a group of people that wants to hear it. It's something that we've wanted to do for a long time. So no better time than the here and now, right? Absolutely. Blaze, Nakano, super, super pumped to get into it. But... This is sort of during a time where um, the WWF Women's Championship has, you know, reemerged. Yes. In the WWF because it hasn't been back for very long, right, Landon? No. I think to discuss the importance of this match, and Spencer, I'm glad you brought that up because to understand why it's a big deal, it's important to understand the history of the WWF Women's Championship. So on September 18th, 1956, the fabulous Moolah defeated Judy Grable at the end of a 13-woman battle royal to become the third ever NWA World Women's Champion. However, Moolah was not fully recognized by the National Wrestling Alliance as champion until 1964 because she had a falling out with the NWA majority owner, Billy Wolf. But do you know who did recognize her as champion? Vince McMahon Sr. Yep. Mm. At that time, the WWE did not exist. It did not actually become a company until 1963 when it was established as the World Wide Wrestling Federation. The WWWF, which they should go back to being called that. That was pretty badass. Yeah, I'd like it. Uh, Mula, who bought the rights to the championship in the 1970s, actually defended the championship as the NWA World Women's Champion up until... May 19th, 1984. 
by this time, the WWWF had been renamed to the World Wrestling Federation. And in 1983, the WWF disaffiliated themselves with the NWA. And Mula sold the championship rights to the WWF, therefore creating the WWF Women's Championship. But they still recognized her as the champion for 30 years. This, yeah, and that's why. Because instead of beginning her reign in 1984, the WWF claimed that the lineage of her belt went all the way back from whenever she first became champion in 1956. Uh, the preceding champions... And the title changes between 1956 and when Mula lost it in 1984 are not recognized by WWE, even though they're recognized by NWA, and they happened. Um, as a result, the fabulous Mula's first reign is considered to have lasted, what, what would you say, 28 years. Yeah. <laughs> this means that the World Women's Champion, or the World Women's Championship that Mula held has two title lineages. Debbie Combs won the vacated NWA Women's Championship in a nine-woman battle royal in 1986 to continue the lineage of the original belt that Mula carried. This is the same Women's World Championship currently held by wrestler Thunder Rosa. I would love to see a title unification match one day. <laughs> Know, knowing that the WWE Women's Championship and the belt that Thunder Rosa has right now came originated from the same belt <laughs> so in 1990 the women's championship uh wwf women's championship became inactive after rock and robin vacated the championship following her departure and at the time wwf just stepped away from women's wrestling essentially yeah it, you know you can talk about the 105 years that the not so fabulous moolah held the belt Right. Um, but, you know, it ultimately le it leads us to a really fascinating history of the belt, you know, to your point, which is which is really, really interesting. You know, talking about unification, how would it work now? Because we've got two women's belts in the WWE. So and I'm not even sure. Th I think that the Raw Women's Championship and the SmackDown Women's Championship. I don't know. Would you are they considered new belts or are they considered a split in the lineage? Well, they the WWE Women's Championship came back at WrestleMania 32, right? And that it was, was only one, yeah, and it became the Raw belt. So because they came, they made a new one for SmackDown. So I don't know if the Raw one specifically is would follow that lineage. I'm not sure. That's a good question. Because I believe, but I don't think so. Because I believe the WWE Women's Championship was a new belt because that's the way Lita sold it, right? At WrestleMania yeah. 32, she said for the the first ever WWE Women's Champion. So, so do you think then that the that the belt that we've been talking about ended in 2010 with like Michelle McCool? I think maybe was the last person. They split it in half. I think that. So could you be would the think case. it's a it's a new lineage now? That's very interesting. I want to know what your thoughts are on that. If if you have thoughts on on the lineage of the Women's Championship, but we'd love to hear it. Um, you know, you listening. I, I said that out loud to both of you guys, but I'm in whoever's <laughs> listening. Um, but the belt reemerges in the WWF in 1993. Um, do, you, do you know how Alunder Blaze won the belt? Wasn't there like a 16-part tournament for this? Well, uh, there was a six-woman tournament. That that's I'm not I, that's sure. That's what I said, a six-woman yeah. tournament. <laughs> I'm not sure. All, ever. all six of the women that they had in the back. Right. Uh, I don't know that, I mean. if this ever really happened. You know, we joke a lot about Rio de Janeiro and all that stuff about tournaments, but I'm not super convinced this tournament itself uh, happened. From my understanding, it happened on Raw. Well, so here's the participants in the tournament. It's uh, Alundra Blaze, Black Venus, Rusty Thomas, Angie Marino, Heidi Lee Morgan, and Allison Royal. For some reason, Alundra Blaze... A apparently, only beat Allison Royal in the first round and then had a bye either in the second or second and third rounds. Well, if it's a six-person tournament, you're going to have one that's a bye. Right, right. Um, but she ends up facing Heidi Lee Morgan in the finals, in the finals of this yeah. tournament uh, on All-American Wrestling in December of 1993. 
there's no real, you know, <laughs> I just don't know how real those other matches were if the first and second round matches ever really happened in this tournament. And the fact that the re-debut and the re-emergence of the WWF Women's Championship belt um, was decided on all American wrestling rather than Monday Night Raw, um, I think lends itself to maybe how serious the belt was going to be taken in this stretch. Because it's only active really for two or three years this time around. Well, and so they, the entire reason they brought the belt back, or rather, the entire reason they brought Alundra Blaze in was to bring the belt back. Right. But let's, let's get into that. Let's get into why that would be. Alundra Blaze, Medusa, Deborah Michelli, whatever you want to call her, is one of the most talked about women's wrestlers of all time. And not particularly for the reasons that I think she would want to be talked about over. Well, do you know where she got the name Medusa, first of all? Well, I know it's an acronym for Made in the USA. Right? How American is that? (laughs) Uh, So she is a WWE Hall of Famer, a monster truck driver. She was... Man, it explains all American wrestling. At at one time... (laughs) She probably asked for it. At one time, she was the commissioner of stardom in Japan. Yeah. I was not aware of that. Yeah. Uh, she, uh, so Alundra Blaze was the first woman to be awarded Pro Wrestling Illustrated's Rookie of the Year. She is the first gaijin to compete in all Japan women's pro wrestling. She was managed by Paul E. Dangerously as part of the Dangerous Alliance in WCW. Some consider her to have ignited the Monday Night Wars by infamously tossing well, the WWF Women's Championship in the trash. I mean, that Nitro. is like one of the biggest moments like in like wrestling because like holy shit like she brought the other belt on tv and dropped it in the trash can oh it's one of the biggest things that ever happened on television i mean it got her blackballed for 20 years (laughs) she is the first woman to hold the wcw world cruiserweight championship and she's responsible for training american pro wrestling stars tori wilson stacy keebler and molly fucking holly Man, we love Maya Holly. Oh, Molly Holly is one of my favorites. She's wrestlers the best. of all time. She's, She's so awesome. good. I was gonna say one out of three isn't bad. <laughs> <laughs> hey, now, like Molly Holly was the wrestler. They were the her and Tori were the eye candy. Tori, Tori Wilson's puppy passed away recently. Did you see that? Oh, mm-hmm. yeah, that's real sad. Yeah, way same, to bring actually, it back. Anyway, actually, same, back to you. Actually, you know who else's puppy passed away? Uh, Brandy Rose's puppy passed away. Did I didn't see that either? Yeah, oh. super sad. Man, can we stop talking about dead animals, please? <laughs> Um, but I, I just want to say, I think Tori Wilson is a better wrestler than people give her credit for. But oh, I'm she just gonna, is. I'm put a but pin I, I feel like sh- she leaned into the sex appeal more than she should have. But oh, well, that was the time. To- that was the time. It was the time. I, I want to blame her. For and, that. Uh, so, so we get to '93, right? She's Alundra Blaze is brought to the WWF to single-handedly rebuild the women's division. They actually changed her name to Alundra Blaze because Vince didn't want to pay her royalties because she owned the name Medusa. He really likes to do that. Like to, you're going to have this name that we own. And if you don't like it, well, it's business. There's the door. You know, it's business. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I understand why that's a good business move. I mean, I, I get it. It's probably easier for him that way. After winning a, what, like, like Spencer was saying, she won the six woman tournament, which was it really a six woman Who tournament? Knows? It really sounds like more like a two woman tournament. They just, I think they just built a tournament around this one really good match that they had. Like, oh, this match is great. Let's pretend it was a tournament. Let's just go re-record the commentary. It makes you more interested in it because this is the first time you see a, a women's championship in three years. Like, you got to make it exciting. Uh, but Blaze was actually the one who had to ask the WWF to bring in more female talent for her to compete against. Which is sort of sad. Like, you brought her in to make women's wrestling a big deal on your show again. Why does she have to go up to you and ask for more competitors? But one of the competitors that we got was Bull Nakano. A.K.A. my favorite female wrestler of all time. Oh, she's so amazing. She's really good. And my favorite thing about her is that she was a professional golfer after wrestling. <laughs> <laughs> Which is impressive considering, like, she destroyed her hips wrestling. Yeah, well, she was a professional golfer, although she was less than the top of her class. 
Uh, yeah. She finished the Futures Tour qualifying tournament in Florida, placed 250th out of 251. Hey, she was in the field, and I appreciate Land. Look, this Landon's golf background research. I appreciate that. That's but, awesome. But well, here's the thing. I actually found out who was the 251st spot. No, <laughs> and and it was Spencer. Oh, there was. You're right. I listen. You you mentioned needing. I thought it was Dale Springs. <laughs> Hell yeah, Dale Springs. That's a good answer. Dale Springs was number one. Yeah. You mentioned needing a lot of hip action in a golf swing to be good. You've never seen me swing a golf club, so you know that I can't. <laughs> that's not listen, always the case. Listen, if you do not know who Dale Springs is, don't worry about it. Look, no, look <laughs> no, him up. Worry okay, about yes, him fine, look him up right now. Dale Springs, my favorite gimmick in wrestling right now. Really good, really, really good. Um, so Bull Nakano, Keiko Aoki, began her career as part of All Japan Women's Pro Wrestling at the age of 15. Nakano did make an early appearance in the WWF in 1986 against Velvet McIntyre and Dawn Marie, who I always forget was in the WWE that early. Yeah. Um, so moving on from Japan, Nakano became the first CMLL World Women's Champion in Mexico before moving on to the WWF in 1994, debuting as an associate of none other than Luna Vachon. I love Luna Vachon. I love Luna Vachon. Uh, it, love. It, love her. Love her. Yeah. Guys, this match at SummerSlam should have been the opening match. No, it should have been the main event. Or it should have been given 20 minutes, and it, and it should have been the main event. Absolutely. Yeah, sitting at eight minutes, it, you can tell that they, they pack a lot of good stuff into this eight minutes, but had you given them 15 or 20, it would have been, I mean as good as any match that year. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It still was, you know, just at eight minutes. It, it was. It's really, really impressive what they do. Crowd loved it. I mean, Nakano looks I like a million it. bucks. Yeah, she comes out as the pirate queen, and I'd like to, yes. think, I'd like to think that in kayfabe that she is Kyrie Sane's mother. Right? I would totally buy that. Because she comes out just as a pirate. I'm like, what's going on here? Well, she's a pirate with nunchucks. Right. <laughs> nunchucks are the weapons of a pirate? Sure. Um, no, that's not actually you sabers. Uh, anyway, uh, I'd like to point out, though, that she comes out to the Orient Express's music. Really? Yes. Oh, I didn't even notice. Well, because you never heard it before. Maybe. But it's it's gorgeous. Her whole outfit is is just awesome. The cracked face makeup, obviously the hair. The hair, yeah. It, it, it's, it's half of what Vince and Jerry talk about the whole time. Is I mean, she's got to use at least three entire bottles of spray. <laughs> like I hair can't spray even imagine. Right. Well, I like how they go so far out of their way to make her look ugly, but it's just not possible. I think she looks great. Yeah, she looks she looks really good, and she plays a really like she looks the part. Right, she looks like someone, and especially with Alundra Blaze coming out, all American, the fire, the blonde hair. Right, Bull Nakano, you know, looks like a really good enemy and ne nemesis yes. to her. Right, well, and that's what I appreciate about. And it a lot. she looks great paired with Luna Vachon. Yes, because Luna also Similar had those, face the, paint. the cracked face paint, mm -hmm. and so they look like they're a really good, a uh, good pairing. Yeah, they I should actually, have been the tag champions. I actually forgot that Luna accompanied her to the ring for this match because Luna does not get involved. She not just, much, a little bit, she but not a much. Lot. <laughs> yeah, but but which is good because it, again, it kind of speaks to how Bull and Lundra are evenly matched, and they have this highly competitive matchup instead of one that's ruined by a lot of outside interference. So after the entrances, which are just fun, I kind of like the 1994 SummerSlam stage. Um, it, it's kind of small. It's pretty simple, but it's just a nice, like, like the logo. It's very summery, oh, yeah. and, the, and the purple uh, stage is really fun. Um, what I appreciated is that they waste no time in Bull Nakano just ragdolling the ever-living shit out of Alundra Blaze. Like, good Lord. Just throws her across the ring like she weighs nothing. And I'm like, yes! <laughs> <laughs> did y'all catch the traditional Japanese flower ceremony prior to this match? Yeah, they did it, but it was kind of like, oh, flowers, yeah, yeah, here. All right, let's wrestle. Like, well, and then, well, Luna Vachon took Bull Nakano's flowers and, threw and ran around. across the ring and tried to hit Blaze with them, which was kind of interesting. And I think it does build off. They had a match, uh, Blaze and Nakano, on Raw on August 1st prior to this SummerSlam uh, that, that was pretty competitive and, and, and pretty um, physical. And it ends in a double countout because they yeah. just can't keep fighting on the outside. And so for it to for it to start that way, um, I with the flower ceremony and things like that, 
I think it's it was a really, really good kind of tell and play off of their August 1st match heading into this SummerSlam match, which proved to be as physical uh, as, as it started and as physical as that August 1st match. I love the sign right across from the camera that says, Bull Will Blaze. <laughs> I love that. Oh, that's good. So I there, noticed that one. That's there are good. some educated fans yeah. in 1994 in the audience rooting for Bull Nakano because Bull Nakano is a badass. Yeah, she is. Uh, what I really enjoy is that she just has an answer to everything that Alundra's Blaze has got. She, she does. She shuts down everything. Uh, and she does a better leg drop than Hulk Hogan. Man, you know, you talk about it. The match starts with Nakano doing those hair throws, like you said, and it's Across brutal. the ring. Totally brutal. And she drops that leg, and it's perfect. Like, better than Hogan, better than Yoko. Fight me. Well, Nakano is incorporating the monster element to women's wrestling, which is it's something you don't see a whole lot of in American wrestling at this time. And I mean, she, she's literally at one point she picks up Blaze with a with he, she's choking her and just picks her up and slams yeah, her just, down yeah, on the mat like a two handed choke, and then she does a choke slam hard. Like this was not your typical. You're gonna take a bump. This was a fuck you. <laughs> yeah, this is. I'm gonna prove how tough to you I am. Yeah, right? I'm gonna throw you straight to the ground. I do love how she does like the one foot pin at one point. I mean, it gets like a one and a half. Like, what were you really expecting to win? But how? What a great heel move! Oh yeah, it's like she. Yeah, she. She does the leg drop and then just does the one leg pin. I'm like, you bitch. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, it doesn't work. Is uh, Blaze kicks out and then she immediately does a surprise jump scare hurricanrana. Oh, I love it. And I, I was love like, her Blaze, look at her go. I was like, 1994 women's wrestling. Remember this? You know what she follows that that hurricanrana up with is a spinning back gorgeous kick. spinning back <laughs> kick. Man, it's flawless. It's her right in the fucking jaw too. It's so good. She tries for a second one, and that's when that's Nakano when hits that the choke, choke slam. slam. And oh, man. I mean, talking about how Nakano just stops Blaze in her tracks every time she tries to get momentum going. And then she does what. Uh, that ain't a Boston crab. That is a Tokyo crab. Yeah, that is a ridiculous Boston crab. I also like how she actually does put all of her weight on the lower back. Yep. Forget, the Boston crab does not wrench your legs. It wrenches your lower back. Pulling your legs back and bending the knees actually is a great stretch. But someone sitting on your lower back while pulling your weight up is very uncomfortable. It's like she has been trained to know how to make a move look as good as it possibly can. But there's also things that Nakano is bringing to the table here that are unprecedented. So there's one move that she does after Alundra Blaze escapes. And, but when, when Alundra Blaze escapes, Nakano is striking Blaze's back. So you kind of oh, yeah. see Nakano uh, lasering in on Alundra Blaze's uh, midsection in her back. And she, she's striking her until she falls, and she ends up wrapping up her legs for a sharpshooter. And rolls Blaze over and lifts her arms off the ground. This is an epic, epic submission. I mean, the visual is is stunning. Oh, it's huge. It, it looks more brutal than anything on the card all night yeah, long, like, right? In terms of submission. It's like this insane move that like we, we don't see again for like 20 years. Right. So we talked about it, uh, you know, kind of before the show. Like, man, what did we call it? Like, what what was it? You know, I just, as I was trying to fast take notes as the match was going on, I, I put it was a, a, a sharpshooter surfboard. Right, because that's how it You're looked in my mind. But it, it's even it's even deeper than that. I think. Right. It's what what did, what did we say it was, Landon? It's a a scorpion double cross or, or something to that effect. Modified scorpion double cross or something like that. I mean, it's it's really really fun to watch. Paige called it the uh, the page tap out. I uh, know. No, the WWE called it the page tap out, and she said okay. But th- but that's a good point. I don't know that we saw this move again until Paige. In what, 2014? I, yeah, right. 20 years later. It, it looked incredibly painful. I mean, incredibly, incredibly painful. Uh, once she actually lets go, Nakano lets go of that hold, this is when Luna Vashon decides to interfere for the first time. And she this is really the only time she interferes in the match. She gets on the apron, um, kind of ties up Blaze for a second. The ref is, mm. is pushing Nakano back. And all it really leads to is Blaze getting to, to do a roll-up attempt on Nakano, which she reverses into after an, kicking out into an armbar. To an armbar. I'm like, God, she just, she's perfect. This is the hottest the crowd gets all night. And they're hot for Alundra Blaze. And which means somebody's doing their job right. Yes, Alundra Blaze and Bull Nakano are doing their job very fucking well. Well, but 
to, I do want to give some credit to whoever is booking Alundra Blaze at this point because Vince. obviously they're pushing her in a way that's getting that, that, that she's getting over, and and in turn, the WWF Women's Championship is getting over, and that yeah. was the whole point. It feels important. And it's and I think a lot of it has to do with one Blaze is is someone that people wanted to cheer for, but also Nakano was such a good heel character oh, yeah. that they wanted to root against her, and that's really it's just really good work done by both women, but actually but also like you said by by whoever booked the match to try to make them both look that way, and it worked really well. I really do like how instead of trying to break the armbar, Alundra Blaze just kind of rolls it over into a pin before Nakano just rolls it right back into an arm bar. Like, that's different. Usually they see them trying to fight out of the arm bar. Or somebody does a power bomb to break it. Uh, I also really, really, really enjoyed how she kept, while the arm bar is still locked in, stood up and did a neck breaker. I was like, that's very unique. You don't see people do stuff like that. Even nowadays, you're like, that's an interesting way to break up an arm bar. <laughs> Yeah, and, and Alondra Blaze does three almost sling blades, right? Back to back to back. Yeah. And you think, oh, man, this is it. Like, it's the, it's the most momentum Blaze has built up the whole match. It's really fast. I mean, she's slamming Akana to the ground. It looks They look really, really good. And I got to say, I don't know on what planet Alondra Blaze is on here, but she attempts to do a power bomb. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, Bullock says, no, I'm just going to basically do an inverted Northern Lights suplex with you on my back. My favorite part about that is when Blaze has Nakano like, in the position for the power bomb. I'm going to power bomb her. Yeah. Nakano no. <laughs> lifts her finger. You can see her wag her finger to the crowd. One side uh-huh. and then uh-huh. the other uh-huh. side. Yeah. <laughs> like, you no, this say girl, the magic word. This woman's crazy. It's so and funny. then she goes for a scoop slam. That was my point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she does that, and then she does a scoop slam. Uh, we get a we get a tip of a backslide. Backslide is going to cut it off. But uh, gentlemen, Bull Nakano capitalizes with a power pop bomb. Up. It's a pop up power bomb. Yeah, once again, twenty years for somebody else made that move famous. Uh, the streak continues. Season three, power bomb. Hey, Pick, we're two for three in picking, season three. Yeah, three picking three. back up from the missed opportunity of a power bomb from the previous match. Yeah, we love that. Uh, but Nakano doesn't. She doesn't get the pin with the power bomb. No, she actually goes up top. Bull Nakano goes up top, and she does this diving leg drop, the Tokyo Jam, that doesn't hit. No, and holy shit! But I'm almost just... glad it didn't because I'm not sure we get a under blaze after if it does. Well, hit, no, that's you know? the way she always did it. She didn't like. Bull, that's the way she did the top rope leg drop mm-hmm. every single time. She landed like that. So whenever she misses and just lands like literally flat like that, and like, that's what I was saying. And she, this woman had hip problems when she got older. I, oh, gee, I wonder why. But she just lands flat like that, like got like spine shut out of the back of her head. And out of nowhere, this beautiful German suplex, bridging for the pin, maintains the bridge, one, two, three, retains the title. Wow. Best match of the night. Fuck you if you disagree. That's all I got to say about that. How about this? This could be the first time ever on last match standing where we've had the same move win the match for back-to-back episodes. Yeah. That's a very good point. And if it was going to be one move, I'm actually really, really happy it was this one. German suplex with the bridge. I'm a sucker for a bridge German. So, so what you're saying good. is the, the, t- the theme of season three will be German suplex bridge pins for the win. Yeah, that's going to be our streak. New streak. <laughs> New streak starts right now. German suplex. <laughs> bridge German suplex. Oh, man. There's only like a handful of wrestlers who still do that. <laughs> man, those eight minutes fly by. It's just a touch over eight minutes, and they're so good. They do such good work together in the ring. Is this the new shortest match on the list? It, no. No? What is? Trish and Lita still shorter by a minute. Uh, it, what, yeah. And speaking okay. of... I think I prefer this to that match. I enjoyed this one a lot more. It didn't feel rushed where that one felt kind of like, we got to get to this. Come on, let's go. Let's go. This one's like, no, no, you've got time. Let's take your time. Uh, Although this moment is not nearly as pivotal as that one. Uh, I really enjoyed this match. I felt like it was like the first time that the women's division was taken seriously by the WWF. Uh, Commentary, despite talking about, oh, Beauty of the Beast, Ah, ah," they did... Spend most of that time actually calling the match competently. And if you watch the crowd, the crowd, the crowd, the crowd is loves. Glued they were to the match. Palm of their hand. 
entire crowd. They went crazy. The loudest they get all night was for this match. And, um, you know, this match probably, we've, we've said, oh, man, I'm actually had 15 minutes. Do you want to know why this match is only eight minutes long? Why's that? Lundra Blaze was injured. What? Was she? She was hurt. Was that, it her ankle? Yes. Yeah, I remember. I think the match I remember they had on Raw, now. she yeah. injured her leg. That's why the match kind of ended in a double count out. And so to she, think she was able to go through and do everything she did in this eight minutes that we just sat here gushing man. over with an injured leg. Yeah. Unreal. It just goes to show, like, wow, like, we never really saw the full potential of Alundra Blaze slash Medusa because it felt like every time she had a big spotlight, she was either injured or in a bad program, or in the case of WCW, they just didn't book anybody to face her. So, yeah, like we never really get to see how just how good this woman was, and it really makes me sad because she was great. Favorite moments? It's I mean, there's a lot to pick from here. Surprise, Hurt Karana, power bomb, that finish, that crowd. Yeah, I think actually my favorite moment is one of the most beautiful bridging Germans I've ever seen. It's gorgeous, and it's it's really interesting because Alundra does try to to lift Nakano in the power bomb earlier in the match, and she's able to actually throw her. In the in the German suplex, which was which was really really cool. So I, I liked how that kind of came back around. And Actually, the bridge is perfect. Uh, honestly, when she just picks her off the mat and does like the choke hold and then like the two handed choke slam, that was extremely impressive. It was like holy shit. Yeah, I mean, Bold Nakano is a fucking beast. She is. I mean, I think my favorite moment might be the uh, scorpion cross fade chicken wing whatever in the world we wanted to call it. <laughs> um, I I it was brutal, and it's just something you don't. You didn't see then. You really don't see a whole lot now. Um, and I just, I couldn't get enough of it. I was, oh, my yeah. eyes were glued the whole time. I, I want to see Bull Nakano face Hokuto or Kandori. I want to see that match like that. They, they were all act at the same time, so that oh, match could have Yeah, happened. I wonder if that match may have actually happened. Uh, Bull Nakano did have a really big program with Aja Kong, so it'd be interesting to look Ooh. into that. They had a cage match like a year later that's supposed to be really good. Well, we'll see you next week on Last Man Standing. We're going to cover that exact thing. <laughs> Nakano versus Kong. Let's do this. Uh, but, guys, it's it's time to rank it, right? So our first women's match of Season 3, um, SummerSlam 1994. You know, last week we were in 1982 when we ranked Tiger Mask and Dynamite Kid at number 16. Um, we were kind of split. We kind of ended up in the middle of where we kind of – where we thought we needed to be with that one. So I'm really curious where this match ranks because – this match has a lot going for it. Uh, one of one of them being that it is from 1994, and we still love it. You know, going oh, yeah. on 26 years later. So I think we're going to be in a similar place to where we were last uh, last week. Uh, and the reason why I said this is because I, I very specifically mentioned Trish and Lita. Um, I felt like this match, in my opinion, is superior. It's a minute longer. But um, that match just felt so frantic as if they were scrambling to get through it, where this one did not feel like they were rushing whatsoever. If anything, I felt like they knew, let's take our time, let's get through this match, mainly because Alundra Blaze is hurt. But um, I enjoyed it more. I thought it was a bigger spectacle. And despite being not as important, I would actually put this at number 20 above the... WrestleMania 32 triple threat. I would put it right above that as these are two really big moments for women's wrestling. I feel like this one is just as important, but it's often forgotten and overshadowed. Yeah, I feel like we've put the important moments for women's wrestling all bundled up right together. Well, no, Bailey um, and Sasha is too much higher. It, it, is too, it is too higher, um, but we have the Charlotte, Sasha, and Becky Lynch at 20 which was huge because it was the the big women's spotlight at WrestleMania. Um, and then right underneath that at 21 is Trish and Lita. And we've talked endlessly about, yeah, <laughs> about why put, that's important. I would put this above both of those. I would put this above Trish and Lita, but I don't know that it does everything that the, the women's triple threat at WrestleMania does for me. So I would actually put it at 21. Okay. Mm. No pressure, Spencer. <laughs> I respectfully disagree with both of you. Okay. Um, okay. One, I don't want to fall into the trap of putting all the women's rat matches next to each other. I don't like, either. I just don't want to. I, I, I want don't... you. Yeah, I, I definitely want to hear. Uh, I want to. I want you to talk me out of this because I don't like how that feels either. Yeah. Well, one, like I, you know, when I 
when I we did Tiger Mask and um, Dynamite Kid, you know, the first match that I compared it to was Jones and Rocco because that's the kind of style that it was. And so that's what it reminded me of, even though, you know, they're pretty similar in terms of time period. But, um, you know, I don't know. They're not they're not both British rounds matches. You know no. what I mean? So so for me, when I think about Blaze and Nakano, I think it's a great match. Uh, but what I what I kind of look at when I'm looking at the list is I put it around really Dean Malenko and Rey Mysterio down there about 34. Okay. Um, and so I would, I would, I think I enjoy this match more than that. So I would put it, that would personally, 34 would be me. It would be right above Dean Malenko and Rey Mysterio. Um, if you want to talk about comparing it to the, to the other women's matches we have on the list, I think it's better than Gail Kim, Awesome Kong. Um, I, yeah, I would I would put it above that for sure. I don't think it's better than the women's triple threat at WrestleMania 32. I don't think it touches Hokuto and Kandori from Dream Slam I, well, 93. To be fair, there's like 40 matches on this, car, on this list that do not touch that one. Right. Well, let's so let's step away from just comparing women's matches to women's matches exactly. because we're we're comparing all of the greatest matches of all time, regardless of if they featured women or mm-hmm. not. You know, I, I do like so Spencer's look, uh, comparison to Dean Malenko and Ray. I, I like that too. So that would put it in the 30s, but we both Actually, wanted you know to what? jump a whole bunch of matches. You know what really jumps out to me? Uh-oh. This reminds me a lot of Awesome and Tanaka. If you take out the hyper-violence, it's a very similar match. In terms of Awesome being the big man, Tanaka being a little smaller. Yeah, if you kind of flip those roles around, yeah. now the Gaijin is the, is the smaller one and the big Japanese monster. Like... I really looked at that. I'm like, man, it, it, it's if you take out the chairs and the tables, it's a very similar match. They tell a very similar story. So I was gonna say, if so, let we put it almost a full, you know, a full section higher. We were in the twenties, we're in the early twenties, twenty and twenty one. So let's look at let's look at the threshold of you know the what? top thirty. Do we think it would make the top? 30. Do we think it's better? Do if it really does, think it's better I probably than, would put it at number 30. Do we really think it's better than the Royal Rumble in 1992? Yeah. That's an interesting one. You know, you, when you, you talk about rewatchability, and... obviously this match I feel like is more rewatchable because it's, you know, 52 you can, minutes shorter. You can watch it 12 times. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, <laughs> the Royal Rumble match in 92, it's, it's got every legend there is, right? There's, you know, how many Hall of Famers are in that match? Um, and it's a really good match with a really memorable ending. Um, but in terms of a wrestling match, it is limited in some way by being a Royal Rumble match. So, you know, I think there's an argument to be made that Bull Nakano and um, Alundra Blaze is better than that Royal Rumble match. But that would leave it at 31. The next match at 30 is Daniel Bryan and Triple H. So where where do we think this match compares to that one? That's a hard question to answer. Uh, by the way, seventeen um, Hall of Famers in the Royal Rumble match. Um, I don't know. Now that I've made the comparison to Awesome Tanaka, I can't like unsee that. So I feel like for me, I put a little bit higher than you. I would not quite put a thirty four. I'm thinking like either thirty or thirty one. Personally, minded. I am getting hung up. If I if I go to the 30s, I would I'd like I, I think the Daniel Bryan Triple H story. It's a it's a good match. It's a fun story. It's a big moment. We were there. It's feel good. This what we're doing with this match is more important. I agree. In my opinion, so I would put it above that. I would put it above Cactus Jack and Triple H. As great as great as that match was, and it's a totally different. Uh, a totally different world from this. I, I just, I feel like what, what uh, my, so my argument with Cactus Jack Triple H okay. is let's think about the number of, of listeners that have recommended Cactus Jack Triple H, right? That remember that match and love it. Let's think about how we remember that match and love it, how much we loved it when we were reviewing it and, and ranking it. It's more memorable. And yes, I understand that Nakano and Blaze is more important. And, and this is something that we've talked about a lot with, our, with any of our matches on the list is how important they might be. But when you think that the women's championship in the WWF was deactivated again the second 
Medusa left for WCW, yeah. it it loses importance for me because we don't get, I mean, we don't get another serious, serious look at the women's championship until almost Trish and Lita in 2004. Yeah. So, you know, like they they bring it back in 98, but it's not taken. But I mean, China, yeah. you know, China's there for a bit. So you take well, it. China, China didn't win it until like she left the company. Because she right. was always wrestling other men. Right. So, for me, it loses some of the value because of the way it was treated afterwards. Yeah. Um, I think I think with that in mind, I could accept your your terms at at thirty four. I, I think I, I think I get what you're trying to say, and that that makes sense. At at thirty four, so right above Malenko and Mysterio, but under Jones and Rocco. Agreed. I'm Paul? buying a losing battle, so I can see. <laughs> You can you can see it. are you are you okay with it being at thirty four? I mean, I'm not against it. It was just I don't know. I just I felt this really strong correlation to Awesome and Tanaka. Well, I think awesome, about the same length. I think Awesome and Tanaka was an awesome uh, no pun intended. No pun intended. <laughs> uh, an awesome feud that was brought over from Japan to show American audiences what is going on in the world. That's of a good point. Wrestling. Where this was like a we just brought up this awesome wrestler from Japan. To build up our star, okay, I can see. I, I'm really interested to see what the listeners are going to say. Yeah, about tell this us. I, I really yeah. want to know where you'd rank it because I think this ranking has been one of the most difficult for us so far. Well, it's. I mean, I think it's one of those that um, you know. When I think back of the first 42 matches that we've ranked, um, this one feels like we were maybe some of the furthest apart on it in terms of uh, of our initial thoughts in ranking it. And it's just one. I don't know how how much this match is similar to others on the list. You know, we've, we're drawing awesome Tanaka comparisons and comparison to other matches on the list, but it's pretty different. Um, but it is important, but not that important because yeah, I feel part of, it's I, overlooked. I feel, yeah. I feel like it's, it gets overlooked because of the way that Alundra Blaze's career went. You, you like it gets overlooked. Um, and it's not fair because this match is fantastic. It's great. It, it's just one of those go out of your way to watch it. Even if that means sitting through SummerSlam '94, <laughs> which is like pretty much, um, it's a two match show. Let's yeah. just let's just be honest with it. It is a two match show, and some people would argue that this is like the real standout match. Um, I I've heard people talk about the cage match between Brett and Owen, and once I've kind of heard people describe it as what it exactly is, it's kind of like, oh. That kind of ruins the match for me now. Well, that, so this one hasn't been ruined for me, so yeah, I'm standing by it. That's a good point. And, and the Brett Owen Cage match is one that we've talked about looking at. And you know, if there was going to be a moment where we put a rematch on our list, that might be a, a match that we we do. It's a, it's a it's a very interesting match to talk about because once once that wool has been pulled over your eyes, yeah, you, you can't put that back in can't the box. Can't see it, and I and I totally get that. Cannot unsee uh, it. But it does. You know, it does say something that on a on a card that's got that match on it that people a lot of people look back and love. Um, we're talking about Nakano and Blaze. Yes, right from 1994, and I think that's really important because I'm not sure if I could name one other women's wrestling match that happens between 1993 and 1995 while that belt's in the uh, WWF. Another match between these two, yeah. other than Blaze and and Luna Vachon, you know, like that's. Luna couldn't beat Blaze, which yeah. is why she brought in uh, Nakano. The but. WrestleMania 10 match with Leilani Kai, but like I like how every match we've mentioned either contains Bull Nakano or Lundra Blaze. And and that's it. It, it was a two-person division almost. Yeah, it was it, built pretty much on this match, and it was never really given another high-profile position. It was like they've had matches on Raw. They had matches on All-American Wrestling. But this is about as far as it went, and it should have gone farther because they really had something here. Yeah, I think it earns its spot on the list. But Spencer, you make a lot of good points to put it where you're saying to put it. Well, I think it, in a way, that the WWF limited the division. Yes. Yeah. I think it limits how high it can go on our list as well, which I think is part of me is like, would it be great if these two were in their prime now? Because where because where women's wrestling is now, I feel yeah. like if these two were in their prime now. They would be like top of whatever company they yeah, talk would about. Be so good, dream. Booking. You know, when we talk about fantasy booking and dream matches, you know, a lot of people will do the the Sting versus Undertaker in their heyday and stuff like that. But what I think about is stuff like this. I think about Blaze versus Sasha Banks, and you I see, think about. I don't think Sting Undertaker would have been great if it happened in their heyday because, let's be honest, I love Sting, but Sting is very limited. He always was. They they were able to build him into this folk hero. He was very, very good at what he did. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying Sting is not one of the greatest of all time because he is. 
But like I think Ric Flair said, I've just pointed my finger down the hall and made this kid a star. Uh, but I think if you had Sting, especially like early 90s surfer Sting against Deadman Undertaker, it would be boring. It would not be the match we'd want it to be. And you definitely can't do it now because they're both pushing 60. I wonder who agrees with that and, and who doesn't. If you have thoughts on that, I, let us know. I think the only time that match would have been, oh, my God, would have been 1998. I think and, that's a really interesting observation. I, I would be really interested to see what the conversation around that would be. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Tweet us at Last Match Cast. You can find us on Facebook the same way. You can email us your thoughts on this match or on any other fantasy booking like that at lastmatchstanding at gmail.com. You know how to find us. We love interacting with you guys, and we want more of your match suggestions. You know, these this stretch of four episodes was all suggestions based from you guys. Oh, yeah. And, and, and the way you voted on, on the poll and stuff as well. So we're just super appreciative for that. And uh, this was really, really hard. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and send us your dream matchups between, like, if Bull Nakano and, and Alundra Blaze were in the business today. I, I, wanna, I want to visualize what that would be. Absolutely. We this, c- was a really, this was a really fun match to cover. Yeah. And it was, it's fun because it's close to home, right? Because we just did WrestleMania 11 mm-hmm. on our Patreon exclusive, <laughs> which was 1994. Exactly. Uh, well, no, it's WrestleMania 10. Would have been 1994. Mm-hmm. Correct. Uh, so we just did 10 and 11 pretty close back together. Yeah, but if you by the time you get to 11, Blaze is gone. Yeah. If you haven't listened to our Patreon exclusive Last Mania standing, we've got the first episode up for free on our main feed. Definitely go check that out. And if you like what you hear, consider becoming a Patreon, uh, a, a Patreon supporter. We would, we would love to have you. It's, it's a really, really fun time. We've got some really, really fun stuff on Patreon coming up as well. Um, and on the main feed, I can't wait for next week. Next week's going to be... Awesome. Like, it's going to be draw-dropping amazing, the match that we're covering, and I cannot wait for that. Uh, so until episode 44, already, episode 44. I know, right? Until then, I'm Spencer. I'm Paul. I'm Landon. And this is Last Match Standing.